All right. Well, uh, my name's Jeremy Mio. Um, given the play, playbook perfection uh, workshop here, um, unfortunately, Amanda Berlin also uh, participates and gives the workshop with me, and she unfortunately could not make it uh, to this um, workshop. So I'll be giving it solo. Um, so bear with me here. Uh, it's also um, giving this virtually. Uh, so I hope everyone uh, enjoys the big uh, head in the room um, as we go through the workshop. Uh, normally, um, the later half of our workshop is hands-on. So I will be going through that uh, myself and guiding along uh, some of the items that we normally would shout out the room and, and get some feedback from everybody. So I'll go through that myself um, and some of the tools that we use when building playbooks. Um, so unfortunately be probably a little watered down than the normal workshop, but we'll go through that and then we'll have the Q and a session, uh, through the chat here. Um, so I'll go ahead and, um, minimize the chat window here and I'll get started here. So we're going to go through, um, playbook overview and concepts. Uh, this is a playbook perfection uh, workshop. This workshop isn't an expert or advanced playbook class, uh, or or you won't learn very advanced methods or, or features in here um, or techniques. However, you will get to know um, generally what a playbook is, why people use playbooks, some of the differences between run books and playbooks um, over time. Uh, some of the difference between response, uh, overall instant response playbooks and detection hunt playbooks, uh, some of the developments um, in playbooks, and then, um, you know, maintenance, maintenance, and more maintenance of playbooks. It's very important uh, to keep playbooks up to date. Um, it's never a good idea to let them sit there um, because things are always changing. And that's the whole purpose of playbooks is to be flexible. So to start this out, we will go through instant response um, just in, in, in general. Uh, this might be, again, a lot of uh, repeat information uh, for everyone, but this is a basic class meant for all. So we'll go over a quote unquote quick overview of instant response. We'll be talking about instant response in the framework of NIST. Uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So we'll go through each one of these, um, starting with preparation, detection analysis, and then containment, eradication, recovery, and then post-incident activity. So we'll go through each one of those, some of the items and things to note about those, um, and then we'll get into uh, some of the playbooks. So we have preparation. So a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, resources should be spent on preparation, making sure that your entire incident framework uh, and incident response capabilities are thought out and planned ahead of time. Uh, this can include, again, communications, facilities, uh, you know, having redundant facilities or alternate facilities is, you know, becoming, um, I would say, less and less needed depending on the situation, especially because of the remote work, virtualization, uh, or virtual, you know, virtual working and everything like that. Um, remote facilities are still, uh, alternate facilities are still good for a lot of business practices. Um, having an alternate facility um, for um, your business or environment, that could be anything from, you know, uh, redundant or alternate facilities um, for handing out equipment that was big in COVID, for handing out different types of um, uh, gear due to not being able to come in close contact. So I think co everyone has learned from, um, you know, the pandemic on uh, different types of just different types of uh, response actions where normally it was always, you know, we just can't get to this building or all of a sudden this network's down and how do we work from there? Um, so 
Again, always um, take into account uh, any type of facilities you might need. Um, one of the bigger things uh, I like to touch on here, especially in the environment today of remote work, is communication. Um, out of band communication and just even normal communication um, and sound communication during incident response is, is, is very important. Um, your incident response uh, preparation or techniques and, and tactics and playbooks can really fall out the window if you can't have good uh, comms. Uh, that could be a multitude of methods, um, depending on your organizational need that can, um, that might vary. Um, it could vary from having um, very redundant communications for executive staff, as well as um, incident response staff, as well as, you know, other types of business units to just having an out of band um, slack for communications. If you believe that, you know, your environment's compromised, uh, you could see in some of the, uh, I believe in the past year, it was an incident where a ransomware group actually had access to the incident response team's environment and was following the incident responders around um, playing, you know, and, and started posting screenshots of them responding. So, you know, it's, uh, it could always happen. So make sure you have solid communications. And the hardware software, again, make sure you have uh, the hardware and the software you need. You don't want to be Googling um, how to, conduct forensics on an iPhone when you're in the middle of uh, trying to remediate an issue or, you know, forensic on an iPad or on a MacBook, just because you had a few MacBooks in the environment that ended up, you know, ultimately getting um, compromised that results in a larger compromise. So you want to make sure that you have um, basic software and hardware available, especially, you know, uh, clean hardware that you can use um, at a given, uh, at any moment. Um, definitely a lot of good resources um, externally for go bags and other types of resources. Um, again, um, you know, what type of resources do you have um, available? A lot of places have third party retainers, uh, legal counsel, you know, maybe through insurances, uh, but make sure you understand your resources, make sure you understand how to uh, enable, uh, work with and uh, enact those resources when needed. Um, and then mitigation software, uh, again, this is, uh, you know, your containment software, your EDRs, make sure you know how to use them, make sure you have training on them. Uh, there, I have seen small businesses that implement a bunch of technologies to get cyber insurance and then they never really understand or review how to use those um, technologies. So make sure you have those uh, prepared. Going on to detection analysis, this is the you know, quote unquote main part of the start of an incident response playbook for a lot of people. Um, goes through, you know, understand your attack vectors, um, make sure to, you know, it, it makes a lot easier to map out those attack vectors when making playbooks uh, and starting and fo focusing on the highest impact and highest attack surfaces. Um, signs of an incident. What is an incident uh, in your environment? What are the signs for it? How do you get notified of an incident? Do you have a uh, super magical XDR that um, does everything for you? Um, or you know, do, you, do your users uh, notify you of a incident such as spam or phishing based on some type of spam mailbox? Or do you use a ticketing system to use all the above? Uh, what are your signs of an incident? How do those ultimately get to your team. Um, and then, you know, going above and beyond when you can start baseline your environment, what is that anomalous activity? What does bad look like in your environment? Um, again, in some, you know, precursors or indicators, you know, what type of indicators uh, not only do you have available uh, in your environment, how can you potentially search your environment for additional indicators uh, once you under, once you find that you've been either compromised of a specific strain or um, of of malware or ransomware campaign, something tells you, hey, this is associated with X, Y, Z. Can you search your environment for indicators? Um, and maybe you can't, but at least you know your capabilities, um, and then you understand at some point in time. Uh, the gaps that you might have uh, that you can review or understand, you know, how you can uh, have some type of mitigating controls or ways to search for things. Um, 
incident analysis, you know, how do you contain or how do you ultimately do your incident analysis? Um, is it ad hoc? Is it through some type of tool set? Um, is you have a you know security operations um, uh, environment or ticketing system that you can kind of go through and do your incident analysis in? Um, how is that documented? Um, and you know it goes on from there about prioritization and notification. Once you do detect something, um, you've analyzed it. How are you notifying uh, individuals? How are you notifying both uh, your team, uh, external teams? Uh, as well as the business, um, when do you uh, when do you elevate that notification to go to you know executive staff and then potentially further if there's any type of large compromise? Um, a lot of you know small businesses uh, getting compromised through uh, business email compromise or some type of spear phishing attack are doing a lot of detection analysis um, and then don't escalate all the way up properly and end up, uh, you know, th they may have been able to stop something in the, uh, they may have been able to stop something, um, you know, ahead of time if they would have properly escalated up the chain instead of trying to go on a solo mission. A lot of, uh, Again, small businesses having only a few IT uh, resources um, may go on these solo missions. You really need to have that notification process, that escalation process that goes back to communications as well. All right, going on to um, containment, eradication, recovery. What's your strategy on this? Um, uh, do you all of a sudden start containing and isolating machines um, based on um, when you smell that there might have been something um, uh, something wrong with a device, something odd uh, in some type of activity? You don't want to over-escalate things, but you also don't want to be too cautious. Um, ultimately, um, you want to be able to understand how you can contain, eradicate um, any type of potential compromises or um, uh, other types of um, attacks. Having that type of strategy when you can contain, um, how much you can contain, and when it's uh, also the specific eradication techniques that are maybe pre-approved. Uh, one example is uh, during uh, an email, business email compromise, or, or more so a phishing. Um, are you removing all those emails from the system? How are you removing those emails? Do you remove emails from, from the system? Um, if it's only 10 users, 100 users, 1,000 users, do you have those thresholds identif uh, identified? And that also is connected to the... Uh, to the detection analysis as well. So you understand the breadth of the attack, um, what's going on and what's happening there. Um, and then from evidence gathering and handling, you know, how is that being done? Once something reaches a certain threshold, uh, do your gathering techniques change? Are your gathering techniques always the same? So they can end up in uh, some type of court or other uh, useful information for um, attribution. How does that, you know, how does that look in your organization? Uh, brainstorming these type, these bullet points here, you know, help really understand what's your overall um, incident response framework and strategy. Um, identifying attacking hosts, do you do that? Um, a lot of people want to go and get attribution and understand exactly who's attacking you, but is that as important at that time versus the other things that you could be doing during an incident response? Uh, and then ultimately, how, you know, what are your capabilities with both containment and eradication? Can you isolate de devices? Do you have a um, segmented VLAN that you can put, uh, private VLAN you can put stuff on um, to analyze it? Um, maybe you have that, but you don't have that throughout your entire environment. There might be different um, techniques you can use in different parts of uh, your area that might not work in others. So having those identified, having those understood, having the tooling um, all documented, um, so analysts and other potential um, IT employees 
have access to that and understand the tooling, especially when you start to work with third parties, when you enact your third party, um, they're going to want to know what your capabilities are, but ultimately they might want to, um, you know, push their tools throughout the whole environment. So understand that as well. Um, if that's something that um, your third party uh, would have to do or would want to do. So you understand how to, how that works as well. Post an activity. Um, this is, um, this is uh, one that we will uh, focus on um, a lot. A lot of the uh, workshops that me and Amanda conduct not only include the playbooks, but also tabletop exercises. So lessons learned, you know, building these tabletops and lessons learned activities off of not only your post incidents, but also other post incidences and tabletops, again, ties into preparedness. Um, understand your lessons learned, where your gaps were, and making sure that somebody was either documenting it somewhere um, and understanding you know, exactly what happened. Maybe you uh, go in and send things out to, I call it deep forensics or a forensics uh, third party to really see what was, uh, what was the root cause. How did that um, phishing attack come in, or how did that malware compromise come in? Was it an email clicked on? Was it a drive-by download? Was it somebody plugging in their USB drive? Maybe you have eradicated, contained and eradicated um, the initial incident, but you really haven't um, understood the root cause. So you really have to uh, understand how you're collecting that data. Um, and then once you do understand that root cause, um, do you go further from there? Do you want to understand if it was attached to a campaign? Um, do you have you, a lot of places might not need to go to that level, uh, but some do, or some may want to at some point in time um, and evidence retention. You know, when you have all of this data gathered from these instances and even the post incident activity, is there some type of retention on that that might be more important in highly regulated environments or uh, government environments, um, but definitely something you want to have identified if you need it or not before all of a sudden your company goes for a merge and acquisition. And during the merge and acquisition process, um, you know, your uh, incident data is being requested for review by the um, company that's doing the acquisition. Um, so again, if it's all there, it's all going to be understood. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing, depending on uh, the business uh, operations. So what are some playbooks in the wild here? Um, so we're going to go through some playbooks um, in the wild. Some of these are pretty... Um, uh, some of them are, are older, uh, but still um, uh, still stand against the test of time. Uh, some of them uh, that we'll go over are uh, very, very, I would say, lightweight examples of how to get started. Um, a lot of playbook workshops uh, I've been involved with in the past have uh, playbook templates that seem like they're made for environments that have full-time uh, incident response, intelligence, whole separate intelligence uh, division, an entire triage team, and just really large um, uh, examples. So when me and Amanda were going through some of our tabletop and playbook exercises and, and workshops, we started to make a more lightweight examples of playbooks um, and trying to find some examples in the wild of those and the also the differences between uh, the different type of playbooks. Um, there's a lot of um, playbooks, run books, um, and again, you have your standard operating procedures and just how do all those fit together? So right here um, is an example. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a really good... Um, uh, incident response playbook uh, uh, book by in O'Reilly uh, by Jeff Bollinger. Um, I'll definitely link it link to it after the talk or after the workshop. Um, but it's a good resource of a lot of more deep uh, understanding of playbooks and how to um, build out uh, 
a playbook framework for your organization. At the end of the day, any organization's playbooks will look different than another one's, but it's good to see some examples uh, to see where even the larger places have started. So this is an example of a Cisco playbook. Uh, this is specifically a detection playbook. Um, this is a technical playbook. Um, a lot of... Um, when doing detection analysis and you have your specific systems, if that's um, an IDS system in this instance, an intrusion detection system, or potentially um, some type of EDR or other types of um, uh, detection capabilities that need uh, some type of query or custom uh, Yara rules or all these things is how are those documented? Um, uh, so places um, that want to make sure whatever they have that they're putting into their EDR or they're putting into their SIM um, and they have these large queries, if it's a Splunk query, uh, you know, or any other system, you know, what is that query doing? Some of these queries ultimately result in alerts will get very, very confusing when another analyst comes in and doesn't understand or can't quickly read some of these queries. So one um, method is to create um, these playbooks, these detection playbooks based off specific um, queries or threat hunting. So you always want to have um, an objective in anything that you're doing. Um, again, this is not a response full playbook, um, but this is a detection um, and a playbook just on one specific technical kind of detection here. So you want to have an objective, just a plain English definition of the uh, working query. Um, so this is a query that's discovering a botnet infection, um, you know, for, you know, infected hosts for remediation. Uh, so when you look at that working query, it doesn't, you know, there might be some things you can take out there. There's some tables it's referring to. You can see it's referring to some type of bot, um, botnet and C2s, but not really, you know, understanding. Maybe you see that it's, you know, it's working, looking at stuff that's tagged with, you know, DNS or some other stuff. Um, it's doing some type of sort and counts, but you really want to have, you know, a, a plain English uh, objective of what this is trying to do. And then you want your actions. You want your, what is your analyst supposed to do um, or what is supposed to happen? And some of these things might go into an auto remediation queue. Um, so depending on what type of capabilities you have, or it might go to, you know, the analyst, um, you know, shared mailbox for analysis. And the action is to create, um, you know, a case manually for review. And then how is, a, how is an analyst supposed to ultimately uh, analyze this, right? Um, this specific report's high fidelity. So that's good to always in the top left there, you can see how there's a naming schema there about HF for high fidelity. Um, again, it has a lot of numbers there and it kind of goes through that as an IDS and malware bot C2. Um, Obviously, in some environments, especially small ones, uh, you might not get that specific. You might not even have technical uh, detection queries that are custom like this. Um, but would ultimately, you know, what what do you do? Having just high fidelity uh, labeled in any type of query or playbook is good um, good practice, so that an analyst knows, hey, when this when this alert uh, kicks off, I know that it's a high fidelity alert. Whatever is uh, happening here is, is known bad. It's not just an informational alert. It's not just saying, hey, you have suspicious activity. Um, this is high fidelity. So it goes through and, um, you know, how do you, you analyze this by, you know, again, reviewing events required, re-imaging if needed. Again, it's not really, I want to say as important to know what's specifically there other than that there are, you know, steps in there, there's password update restriction, you know, there's, um, if a client's on a VIP list, you're doing something different. Again, just important things to note when making these, even a small playbook like this for a specific detection technique. Again, this isn't the playbooks we're going to go over. We're going to go into just general overview of, um, of uh, playbooks based on specific attack uh, vectors and um, incident response um, items. However, it's good to know how these look. So going into kind of the, the whole other 
um, version of playbooks here is a spam and triage playbook. This is a, what I would call like the bare bones of a playbook. Um, this is a playbook um, just built inside of OneNote. Um, it's going through um, and just saying if a, when, when a team needs to triage a spam um, instant response, what are they doing? Um, so again, you got your, you know, kind of your, got an identification phase, but you got your investigation, you got your containment response, you got your reporting and communication there. You're linking to an SOP for the spam system. So analysts know, Hey, I forgot how to do something. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. Um, and then you got your severity identif uh, identifications. So that's important to have. Um, this is obviously working with spam. So do you, um, respond differently with a spam uh, incident that has 10 users to a thousand users to 2000 users to 5,000 users. Um, and this is in yeah, obviously a place that has 5,000 plus users, but this could be different based on if you're a business of 300, maybe you deal with, you know, anything less than five differently than you deal with a hundred, then you deal with like everyone's getting this right. There's some type of level anywhere, depending on any level that you might be involved at of, you know, how you deal with something differently. Um, and then what are your reporting vectors? Uh, a lot of uh, places will say, oh, well, we get either a ticket or, you know, our system will tell us. Well, there's a lot of reporting vectors that you might not think of. They might not happen often, uh, but you you definitely want to understand and have them documented. So when an, um, an analyst gets something or anyone, you know, is is reviewing something, they know how something can come in, what they, what should they even be re, uh, reviewing to make sure that those reporting vectors are come, are properly identified and reviewed. I know that um, some places would have an external notification and they had an external mailbox that uh, people could um, send things to and they were just never checking it. They were only checking their internal service desk um, email. So things like that, you were re receiving a support desk ticket, uh, you're reviewing, you know, reported spam, right? There's some type of spam mailbox. Um, you know, there's potentially a systematic notification from some uh, system specific. Um, there's external notifications, again, from somebody external. This could be anyone from a business partner to potentially the, you know, secret servers, FBI notifying you of, of you know, suspicious activity. Uh, or it could be a, a, a provider saying that you've been blacklisted, right? Things like that. Um, um, uh, separate systematic alert or instant response. Again, that could be a slew of systems. You don't have to put every single system down there, but how do you, do all those systems go to a central place or not? It's, it's good to know. And then you go over to these investigation procedures. Um, so you're going through, how do you investigate spam, right? Um, a, if you're, if it's a severity one or two, meaning it's a, it's a large, you know, thousand to 5,000 users, um, skip, skip and go right to, you know, seven, eight, right. Go right to something else. Right. So go, go right to, you know, containment analysis, uh, steps. Um, however, um, if it's not, you know, you're reviewing the spam, making sure you're reviewing headers, right. All kinds of basic stuff. Um, you know, what are the indicators? Does it have a link? Does it have an attachment? Uh, do you have a place that you can, um, you know, throw a sandbox? Do you have a link analysis uh, system that you throw a URL in? Um, I've, you know, gone through and reviewed, you know, small teams and three to four people um, are, you know, have an, they have an analyst team of three or four people. They're all using different systems for link analysis. Um, some of them are all just throwing stuff randomly in virus total. You know, you really want to understand how those, uh, how the specific places you want to use for link analysis. You might have a paid tool. You might not have paid tools, but at least you could use consistent tools. You might have multiple ones, but at least if they're documented. And then, uh, you know, reviewing the message for other indicators, right? Is it ad click? Can you, uh, is it just an unsubscribe marketing mail, right? Are you, again, going through and, you know, reviewing other types of emails, again, Office 365 versus your, you know, this uh, specific one's referring to Barracuda, um, you know, do you understand how to uh, go through that linking to other SOPs? Uh, OneNote's always nice to kind of go through and start 
building a pre- procedural playbook like this, where you can link to other procedures at first or get an understanding, um, but also just an example. Um, you know, you can throw um, playbooks in any type of tool. Uh, again, going through the containment and response procedures, again, how do you block, how do you block stuff in a web filter? How do you block things in the email filter, right? Do you, um, you know, how do you review the sandbox reporting? Um, and, you know, are you using some type of other, you know, log tooling? Um, so again, this kind of goes on uh, more. Do you search and purge? When do you purge email? Are you purging email? on, you know, someone, you know, reporting two phishing emails, or are you only doing that if it meets a certain threshold? Um, so understanding that, um, and, you know, how do you go through account remediation? Again, ultimately, if something was, um, there was an account takeover, again, links to another playbook of account takeovers um, and quarantining uh, specific machines. If now the devices are compromised, how do you go through and, and how do you remediate that? And then additional reporting. Again, afterwards, do you report to your va- vendors, right? This in this case, you know, Barracuda, Microsoft, you know, whatever else you might have, do you report everything that's missed? You only report it if it gets to a certain point in um, an incident response. Uh, Are you reporting that during the incident? Are you waiting afterwards? Um, All those things you want to understand that you might not really um, think about because you're always responding to one's one here, two there. But when you get to a point where you're getting hammered pretty hard, you know, having this document really helps out. Uh, with any type of playbook, um, it's always recommended to have some type of visual flow um, with that. So even though that was a procedural playbook going out uh, for an analyst to make sure that they're doing the specific steps during all the phases of incident response, uh, you always want to have a visualization. This helps even management. This helps auditors. This helps even, even you know, yourself understand what are all my steps, what are all my decision points uh, during a playbook. Now, this can only you can only go to the what if or the decision game so so far until your playbook looks like some type of giant super you know mind map. But you want to have some basic. Um, basic workflows here. Um, Again, there are a lot of tools out there. We'll go through one specific tool uh, when we go a little hands-on here, but there's a lot of tools out there. Again, just basic workflow tools that you can go through and uh, start to map it out. Um, And it's a good place to have discussions uh, with the team about. It's also good to have with your playbooks uh, or playbooks uh, with your tabletops. So you have them up and say, hey, uh, oh, that's a that's a question we would ask, but it's not anywhere in our you know workflow here. Um, so again, an example of uh, going through again a phishing playbook. It's going through about parsing, evaluating the email. Um, then you know if it's containing a URL attachment. Again, you're handling that differently. Um, and then you know if not, you're you know do you email and notify the user again? This is very very basic. Obviously, if you find that it's a malicious email, you know, do you delete the you delete the emails or maybe you, you don't um, uh, for whatever reason? So again, this is a very simple one, but also probably more than what a lot of people you know have today, even if they're doing all of this. Here's a little bit bigger one. Um, this is where you know. Um, this is an example of uh, Amanda. Um, again, Amanda. Uh, Amanda is, uh, uh, again, at heart, a detection engineer and works for a company that provides um, uh, SIMs and SIM services. Uh, so this is an example of one of their playbooks specifically to one of their SIM detections. Again, this is a web shell, uh, web shell via access logs here. And it kind of goes through um, the process and more of a mind map about um, what could happen if this is normal activity um, or is, is there other things going on here? And it, and it creates a little workflow. Um, they use a tool called XMind. Um, it's a tool that we'll go over and review as well. And um, we also provide in our workshop and our training, uh, we provide uh, uh, playbook templates. Um, we'll go through... Um, um, and probably provide links and the trainings for the playbooks. And 
uh, when we go, um, when we normally go through the uh, playbook, uh, our larger playbook workshops, which is available through uh, Anti Siphon, uh, it's a four day uh, tabletop and playbook workshop. We go through and we'll actually build out these, I'll call responsive playbooks. So with the responsive playbooks, again, it goes through um, the reporting investigation and some response. It's just a template. Um, so we'll definitely provide that in the resources. Um, and I'll also, uh, when I start the hands-on section, I'll go through and uh, provide uh, provide that as well um, and go through some of the examples that we have. Uh, so right now, here are some of the playbook um, use cases that we'll go through. So as you all are there, I know some of you are virtual and some of you are in a room. Um, go through and uh, take some notes on um, when we go through these playbook uh, use cases here. We're going to go through both business email compromise as well as uh, ransomware. So we'll go through um, uh, the BEC here, and I got to kind of change my view here. So I apologize when I change my view over. I might have to stop me. Okay, that's better. So I can see the whole screen here. Uh, so this one um, in this tabletop exercise, uh, you know, Bill received an email directing him to update his password on the organizational's financial services website. And after clicking the link in the email, entering his credentials, right? Updating his password, everything seems fine. Then he's confronted about a large authorization, you know, execute under his account and no recollection of it. Turns out, again, the email link uh, directed to him was an evil twin website. Malicious actor, again, compromises credentials. So here's um, a tabletop scenario that we go through and work with uh, individuals on, on man, Bill. He uh, definitely put his credentials in and uh, authorized execution under his account. Um, you know, what's, what's gonna happen here? So what, what do you, just thinking about this scenario um, in your environments um, and, and just, again, jotty down you know, when you're trying to create some of your playbooks is, you know, what, what tools um, can you leverage to decrease the effect on these attacks, right? And what, you know, when you go through that attack vector from, um, you know, Bill receiving an unsolicited email from an evil twin, to him then clicking on that link, that link going somewhere, uh, for him then putting in credentials, and then separately, you know, obviously, credentials being stolen, you know, that attacker is now utilizing that, uh, utilizing um, uh, whatever is doing that author account authorizations and potentially wire transfers, that attacker is doing that probably not within the network, probably somewhere else, right? So what type of, you know, tools are there in front? Do you have a cloud-based uh, system that's doing, um, you know, financial applications? Does it always require internal access? Are there a lot of things there that you want to map out and understand? Again, do you have, you know, again, do you have additional items for support for blocking phishing attempts or reaching end user mailboxes? Um, again, you all probably have some type of spam or egress analysis on email. You know, what's, what's there? How is that configured? You know, does, you know, staff feel comfortable confirming senders, right? So during security awareness training, you know, does staff feel, you know, or have the understanding to always challenge, um, you know, who is sending or even understand how to identify that, right? That's some just basic security awareness. And then, you know, going down through, you know, does your organization provide, you know, again, that same thing, right? Do they feel um, comfortable with it? Is, is staff constantly empowered to, to feel that. Um, uh, if you haven't already done so again, you know, do you have multi-factor or not? That's obviously a big one. That's uh, one that's, you know, everyone's pushing for. Um, if you don't have that in your VIPs because they don't, you know, want um, to have that um, burden or understand that burden uh, for a reason, 
Um, can you implement, you know, hard tokens with them, right? Can you do multi-factor in different ways to get them there? So it's not, um, potentially as inconvenient, um, as others. And then what's your protocols, right? We kind of went through this going through the incident response, um, items as well. And, uh, you know, who from your organization should be notified once something gets, you know, hopefully, you know, this never happens to um, uh, any organization. But once that does happen, uh, do you have regulatory um, requirements? Do you have some other type of, uh, of requirements to notify other parties? Um, there's a lot of, of, you know, newer legislation out there. Some of them are per, you know, state um, as well. So understand when something like this happens, or if even it did happen, how you have to, you know, notify who you have to notify. Um, and you might be a part of a, you know, an, a corporate environment, you know, another company, and you're just a subset, you have some type of reporting, reporting requirements internally, uh, depending on, on what's, uh, what's there. So just think about some of those. Um, normally in this workshop, we would kind of uh, go through and then go back into um, go into XMind and kind of go through uh, how we build some of those. So I'm going to attempt to switch my share over to my XMind and see if um, if I don't um, if I can do that. And I see just in the chats that, yeah, the, the slides will be shared, um, by the way. So let me, sure, I'm going to stop my share and then I'll share out my XMind here. All right. So I, I'm not sure how that looks, at least on the big screen, but hopefully I can kind of zoom in here and go through just an example. I already kind of wrote some of these out. Normally we go through the whole room um, and uh, kind of get people to start thinking. Um, so again, this is going to be a little bit different uh, um, uh, experience. So I'm just going to pretend uh, you guys are telling me uh, really good things. So um, we have, again, this is our BDC playbook. This is a similar tool that we um, shared in uh, the workshop uh, slides. Uh, this is XMind. Uh, it is... Um, uh, it has a, a quote unquote free version. Um, but again, there's a lot of other uh, kind of tools like this out there. Um, again, it's it's really easy just to kind of brainstorm with uh, your team, uh, especially during uh, a meeting or some type of tabletop to understand, hey, how do we how do we do some of these things? So when you go through your preparation, again, we talked about awareness, tabletops, you know, do you do tax simulation? Do you do fishing exercise. What do those look like? And then you can always go through and you can start to um, uh, go through and say, hey, we use, um, oh, see, it seems like my, there we go. So you go through and say, hey, tax simulation, we use, you know, um, X, you know, system um, for, you know, you know, you know, email simulation right uh, or phishing simulation and you might you can then further link out to these right um, uh, how do you conduct those phishing tests how often right so you could start to go through and map some of this this is the preparation which again is kind of the the smaller portion here of it but then the detection analysis you know you have a user can report it um, maybe the user reports it Again, using you know the um, you know the help desk uh, line, which is you know X you know three thousand, um, and then maybe there's a you know all of a sudden you know uh, a sock you know twenty four seven line that's you know X nine thousand, right? Things like that, and you could say this is how we get user direct. Um, environments. Maybe there's other ways that you get user reports. Um, I, I do have an system alert. I kind of have a spam button, but maybe you have, you know, your users have the spam button too. So that might be better, you know, identified uh, with the, the user reporting. And then you can kind of include these SOP and links. And again, this seems really basic once you start to see all of it already kind of in here, but it's um, it definitely gets um, when you get into the more complex playbooks or, for instance, like some of the, the ransomware 
playbooks. Again, you can detect, you know, uh, phishing email can be the root cause of a ransomware email. Like you have so many things that start to connect to each other that it was really helpful to put these all on some type of visualization. Um, so again, you know, you get the email detection, maybe your email system at some point, like, Hey, we were detecting some, you know, phishing we're detecting some type of, um, you know, influx in malicious emails. Um, and then, you know, maybe you have a SIM, right. That's, uh, you know, quote unquote does some things and, and maybe there's some tears that shed there, um, and whatever that response looks like, um, you know, um, uh, XDR, if you, you know, have, you know, that, that fancy thing of all of the detection responses, uh, together, um, you know, maybe, maybe you're, uh, maybe you're doing well, or maybe you're sitting there, um, trying to understand how it works. Um, and then automation store, right. Maybe you have some things that are automatically doing, there are a lot of newer techniques out there and systems that have some type of automation soar. And that's great. Um, I know we, we use one, um, that works pretty well, but that thing can start to really, you want to start to understand those, right? So, um, because they can start doing some false positives after a while. Um, and you might not know that that's happening if you're not, uh, understanding how that automation or, or SOAR, um, is working, uh, again, from a SOAR perspective, that's a orchestration automation, um, uh, you know, response, uh, for security ops, um, but understanding how that is. And then if you have a third party that under, uh, that that's detects something, right? How do you respond? I didn't put anything in there, but you know, how does, how do you respond with that? Um, if, if it's a third party and it's, you know, say it's, you know, federal, um, you know, some type of federal uh, LEO, right? Federal or, or local, depending on uh, where you're at. Um you know, what do you do with that? Right. So all of a sudden you got that and people are like, oh, well, we'll do whatever they, they say. Well, uh, you know, you might want to, you know, verify, um, you know, verify the contact, right. Um, if the, you know, FBI calls you and says, um, Hey, we've detected, you know, phishing, um, uh, compromise on your guys' system, please, please do this thing. You, you might want to contact that local field office in some form. Um, so make sure you have your contacts, you know, there, um, um, beforehand. Again, there might be other third parties you get. It might be, you know, some type of, um, uh, uh, parent company, right. Um, you might do something different there. Um, other third parties, uh, might be your, you know, MSSP, maybe you pay some type of third, you know, party to do so security. Um, and you know, what do you do there? Um, or it might be one of your vendors. Um, you know, I know that um, uh, places like, you know, Cisco, Microsoft, if you're using some of their products, they see something really, really, really bad. They might notify you of something depending on uh, uh, the, um, uh, the urgency of that. Um, so, and again, if you're a government agency, you might have all kinds of other types of third parties, um, or, you know, financial institute, it might be, you know, something specifically like, you know, maybe there's an ISAC as well. Right. So you might get, you know, some type of ISAC, uh, ISAC is an information sharing analysis center. So what do you do when you get, you know, notified, you know, by that? So, and I'll just keep everything here. Uh, And again, now, how do you analyze it? Um, so, uh, you know, when you when you go through your analysis, um, uh, what do you look at first, right? Okay, user's reporting something to me. Um, there's, you know, the user has, you know, you know, Jane Smith is a user. She's reporting something to me. I need to look at this. Um, I, my the first information I have is Jane Smith, right? So I should probably know it or be aware if that person's an admin privileged user, maybe they're a VIP and maybe that matters. Maybe it doesn't, but it, it you know, um, it's good information to have from um, an analysis or an analyst perspective to know um, what's, what's happening. And maybe, you know, um, James Smith is a, you know, contractor, right? Different type of user type. You should have those, you know, whatever tags or some type of system you have for special response or whatever you care about, whatever's important to your business, you might want to have um, that understood depending on different users that report things.
and then from the technical analysis of the email, um, you know, you look at the headers, you know, how do you do that? Um, you know, you might have an SOP, you might not have an SOP on that. Um, there might be specific, uh, if you, you know, from being a security analyst, you know, uh, analyzing headers are pretty uh, second nature, but maybe you have some gotchas with your system. Maybe you have specific, um, you know, MX, uh, uh, you know, MX, records, maybe you have specific things about DMARC and SPF that you want to have documented. Uh, so an analyst should know, you know, where, where that information is. So maybe this links to just, you know, known good um, or, or known uh, information on, on how you guys review, you know, headers. And then if there's a UR link, we, we talked about this before, you know, how is that URL link being analyzed. What are you using? Are you using the same thing every time? Um, and the impacted size, again, how have you searched for like uh, subject header or subjects? Have you searched for like emails in some fashion? Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, phishing sprays that happen that are just incrementing, you know, different numbers in the subjects, um, uh, you know, coming from different emails, different, you know, relay points, you know, do you have the ability to review um, and understand if that's hitting without doing a lot of a manual searching or, or not? And then at some point, you know, is deep analysis needed? Do you really need to um, carve out those artifacts, you know, depending on, does it look pretty advanced or is it just, you know, um, the, one of the fiscal uh, people sending some type of crazy, you know, Excel macro that they need uh, that's completely legitimate um, or not. And then uh, again, going in to your uh, containment er er eradication, you have, you know, capabilities between system, right? Email, network, device, identities. You might have more uh, here. You know, how do you do these things? When do you do them? Um, so this, again, examples of how this can be, um, uh, this can be understood and this can kind of be organized out. Um, and again, in the email purge here, you might have, you know, inside of this, you might have, um, you know, you know, how, how, when do you, when do you e email purge uh, versus not? Um, so when you have, you know, impact, um, you know, maybe do an impact analysis, um, and then maybe, you know, you have some type of, um, you know, team review before you start purging emails out the system. Um, and then maybe you have some type of, you know, um, uh, retention, um, retention on, uh, if I can spell, uh, retention on, you know, the emails you're purging out. So maybe you're copying those um, uh, out somewhere or not, um, especially when you, you're, you know, a law firm and you start purging emails, you might want to be careful um, uh, what you're doing uh, between, you know, uh, you know, soft delete versus hard delete. Um, and maybe there's a, you know, situation depending on the organization that you do want to not only do hard deletes, but you have a separate archiving system somewhere that you need to remove those emails from too. Uh, depends on a lot of things and it depends on a lot of um, uh, business operations there, but you want to understand, you know, some of that. I don't think that many people take um, consideration how how impactful email purging is, especially IT individuals that are used, oh, we just delete the email from the server and the system. You know, in this today's day and age, you know, how, you know, delicate that might be depending on the business. Um, again, going through, um, you know, your networks, uh, network containment capabilities, right? IP domain blocks, network segmentations. Do you have a, you know, isolation VLAN you can put things on um, while, you know, they're pending review, right? So there are some things you can do um, in, you know, while you're doing some of the containment, maybe you just put it on um, isolated VLAN while you understand if it's, you know, how bad is that, um, um, and you have different types of capabilities within that, or maybe you don't have those capabilities, but you, and you understand that as a gap. 
Um, again, device when you're you're isolating versus re-imaging, um, and then again, you keep kind of you can kind of go down and understand these. And once you start to really um, map these out, it becomes uh, somewhat organic um, of a you know base template again for your playbook. You know, this right here is just almost a somewhat of a mind map of a playbook that needs to be, I would say, fully written out and then workflowed between different decisions that need to be done. Um, and again, recovery uh, might be, you know, you might have different recovery options. Again, this is a business email compromise. So um, recovery might vary there, but if this was ransomware, right, how we, how we review, how are we going to um, recover um, in a ransomware um, uh, situation. Um, and again, it might be different based on what area that the ransomware initially compromised and spread to, or if it was a full, um, you know, ransomware uh, compromise, you know, what, how does that look? And, you know, how, when you start to recover, what do you start to recover first? And then the post incident, right? So we have the root cause um, uh, when, you know, when you might do a root cause analysis first, maybe you don't always do a root cause analysis depending on the impact. Forensics doing, um, again, doing after incident forensics uh, to understand maybe more, maybe there's again, um, um, uh, other types of information you might want to understand or maybe need to understand depending on the overall um, uh, uh, aftermath of the incident. If there was a large, uh, you know, financial burden or you had to get your insurance, uh, cyber insurance involved, you might have to go through um, uh, more deeper forensics and overall review process. Uh, do you review with your vendors? Um, so, you know, this got through your really fancy, um, you know, XDR, spam, phishing protection, you know, at some point you review that with your vendor to see that you first have everything configured properly. Um, is there something you could have done beforehand or ultimately have you grown out of, you know, whatever vendor you're using um, for, um, uh, that specific security control, or do you just need another security control that that vendor doesn't offer? And you need to, you know, understand and fill that gap with something else. Then can you always, uh, create a tabletop, um, and after action or a tabletop exercise based on this incident, um, did any of your previous tabletops cover an incident like this? And, you know, why did you not understand, you know, some of the items that had lessons learned that happened, uh, with this specific incident. Again, this has a lot of relations with the original, the, the first kind of preparation phase. So when you go through, again, this is just kind of an example here um, that you can go and I'll try to, uh, I think I what I'll do is I'll, um, I think I can export this um, into uh, the uh, XMind and then provide it either on our Git or I can send it separately uh, as well, just so everyone has just kind of this, little, you know, section here. So that's kind of just an example of the BEC uh, going through um, uh, that. Is there anything else? I mean, I would like to attempt to interact somewhat with uh, the audience here on the chat window, maybe, um, is, uh, you know, is there anything else? Um, uh, definitely we'll be able to provide the link and software to the tool. Um, uh, I'm not in a position to do that right away while I'm sharing, but I will do that. Um, is there anything else, um, uh, that maybe you would, uh, involve in a BEC, uh, playbook that wasn't covered here? So I'm looking for some, somebody to participate here. All right. Well, that's, um, I was prepared with my own question. So, uh, during the, oh my, does it see, oh my, that was exactly my question. I specifically left that out. So, uh, the question is, 
someone's paying attention, um, uh, was a decision to engage in-house legal, or I was going to say more so the cybersecurity um, or cyber insurance, right? So again, when, at what process do you want? You probably want to understand that obviously in the preparation, right? So you want to understand, um, you know, your uh, legal and what's called reg, uh, you know, requirements, right? Um, so um, I am like the worst speller here, but uh, you're on, understand your legal and regulatory requirements. So again, you might have, um, you know, you might have in-house counsel, um, right? So um, let's put legal there, in-house legal, right? So you might have uh, external legal for whatever reason, especially for certain uh, things. Uh, a lot of places do have both uh, internal and external. Um, and then uh, cyber insurance, right? Um, so look at that, everyone's uh, paying attention to cyber insurance, right? And this is really interesting. So this cyber insurance, again, um, has, um, you know, these relationships and I'll be all, uh, you know, fancy here with, uh, relationships. Um, it's a cool tool. Um, so thank you, Woody. Uh, that is, um, X mind. So, you know, what do you do with uh, some of this, right? This becomes its whole own. I've seen places that have entire playbooks just on legal requirements and cyber insurance. So like in, um, you know, again, in cyber insurance, um, I'll just be here. So, right, again, uh, in your cyber insurance, uh, what's, what's even required, right? So um, what's covered? So, you know, you kind of go into here, you say, you know, you want to understand your coverage, Right. Um, is there any vendor requirements? So I'm going to start kind of at the top here. Um, you know, vendor requirements. Um, so vendor recs um, is an interesting thing in cyber insurance um, because some cyber insurance will require your forensics or your third party or your MSSP to be approved by them or for you to use one of theirs. Um, I do have access to the Discord chat. Um, Right. So, um, so again, vendor, vendor, um, vendor requirements, right. Cyber insurance. And then rights. Um, uh, there's also a thing again to understand is breach coach, uh, couch, <laughs> uh, breach coach. Um, and this is usually where your legal, um, uh, your legal, um, with your cyber insurance gets involved. And again, you need to make sure that, you know, these understand with your in-house legal uh, here. Um, so, uh, yeah, making all these look really fancy relationship things, right? So understanding, you know, how, you know, all these play together um, and even your coverages too. Your coverages could be different depending on uh, the specific attack vector, um, business email compromise versus ransomware. A lot of cyber insurances have been covering uh, ransomware only as co co uh, co pays. Uh, so again, understanding that what's needed, uh, when do you uh, uh, when do you uh, when do you enact or notify your legal counsel? Uh, legal counsel is. Um, it's really interesting to get your legal counsel involved with some of your basic tabletops, even like that one with Bill that we went through. Just getting your in house legal say, hey, when this happens, um, you know, say that this happened, but Bill didn't put his credentials in. Do you would you still want to know? Right. I mean, again, at the end of the day, I don't think legal wants to be known for every type of uh, incidents uh, uh, that's happening. Uh, but at what point do that? You want to have that very clear and understood. Um, and then, you know, uh, I think some people said law enforcement, right? That's a whole thing of when does LEO involved, right? Um, so when does, and that's something that, again, your legal, uh, you know, will ultimately probably determine, but, a, but again, when your legal does say, yeah, involve law enforcement, what, what does that even mean? Who do you reach out to? Do you even know who to reach out to, uh, in your area? So you might, uh, not, uh, uh, and depending on what's happening, your contacts might be different. Uh, so things like that. So um, again, uh, a lot of people uh, do believe about, you know, engaging law enforcement immediately in fraudulent transactions. I definitely, you know, 
suggest uh, you to get your legal involved in that determination, um, uh, just so it's your legal doing that, and not uh, you know the IT guy uh, or or woman just. Uh, reaching out uh, directly to law enforcement all of a sudden in house legal, getting that, uh, you know, law enforcement coming in uh, and getting, you know, a little out of hand there. But it is good to understand that before, because I think that in any situation, you know, all of these um, uh, individuals have to be contacted, but it just might be in a specific order. Uh, it might just have to be very quickly. But if you don't have all this thought out, then you're not going to, you're not going to be prepared. Um, I see uh, Woody kind of talking about cyber insurance, uh, knowing the resources uh, they provide, right? Might Again, discounts, right? There are a lot of interesting uh, extra um, coverages uh, that cyber insurance sometimes has available, depending on your underwriter, as well as your ultimate, ultimate cyber insurance provider. You might work through a broker that works through an underwriter that then works with the, the, the actual cyber insurance. Um, and each one of those individuals might have uh, different um, uh, uh, value added services. Um, so, uh, and they might have them at some type of discounts. Again, if you're using their service, they, they probably um, will come in and do an, an assessment um, and, uh, the cyber insurance, you know, understands that these are professionals and if the, that they're doing that assessment, that assessment comes back clean, you know, ultimately the cyber insurance, you know, uh, has potentially saved money on uh, any type of claim because, you know, you're kind of better than maybe most. Um, so that's a good, um, kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of workshop of how we can start to going through and mapping these out. You can start building like these relationships um, and, you know, you can do all kinds of, you know, fancy, you know, uh, stuff that is pretty, again, pretty simple overall in um, the grand scheme of other tools I've used. But again, there are a lot of tools. I know a lot of people that use just draw.io is another link. Um, again, that has a lot of just basic templates, workflows, and charts, um, and, and something that um, is also useful. Um, so I'm going to stop my share and go back to my slides here. In here, we're going to do something similar. All right. So we're going to go through um, you know, some, uh, ransomware tabletop here. So Sam and physical security calls explain, Hey, computer we use for badge entry across the whole organization has a splash screen with a countdown timer. It's a little odd. Uh, I tried to reboot it, but you know what? Screen never went away. Uh, the computer's unfortunately not again, this is an asset on file. So it's not in your, um, inventory. Uh, so you failed again, CIS control number one there. Um, and uh, it's directly connected to your endpoint VLAN. So it's maybe should have been an asset on file. It's definitely not domain joined. It's, you know, something solo on the network that uh, was probably there longer than any of us. And now it's, um, you know, the, uh, the patient zero for a ransomware attack. So what, uh, again, asking yourself during these playbook creations, uh, how are you going to find out the capabilities of the malware? Um, you know, again, remember this is a machine that um, is not in any type of asset database or inventory. So it probably doesn't have your EDR, doesn't have, you know, it's not logging anywhere. Um, uh, so, I mean, to the day you might find the capabilities quicker if it starts infecting another machine. Uh, but what do you do? Uh, how do you go and, and get that machine? Um, and then identifying potential compromised devices. When that machine starts uh, interacting with, you know, um, other machines that uh, might be, you have more, you know, telemetry and capabilities on, you probably start to understand those. But what about all the other ones that aren't in asset? How many things are not in your inventory database now? Um, and then, right, how do you find and fix, you know, any type of vulnerability? Say it was with the badging system, say it was a, you know, um, outdated Java on that machine, right? You have to, how do you understand that? Um, 
And how do you find out if these devices are patched regularly, right? All these, um, again, it could be an IOT like device. It could just be, you know, a basic machine with this bad, you know, the software on it, um, that was purchased through the vendor, um, but again, if it has to continue to be a vendor support device, because that's all that they will support with the contract, you know, how do you make sure that they patch things regularly? Again, this kind of gets off of the, you know, outside the more of the ransomware, but how do you just deal, how do you deal with, uh, you know, devices that you might not have as much control over on the network? Um, again, how do you disclose an incident, right? This is a pretty base question. Um, and then what steps, right? Um, and then, you know, as any company in, in the news has had, you know, do you pay the ransom or not? Um, a lot of another thing in cyber insurance, a lot of cyber insurances do unfortunately have the uh, the service and capabilities for ransomware, uh, quote unquote, negotiations and payment services. Um, so places can, um, don't have to figure out you know, coin wallets on the day you're ransomware. Um, but again, how, you know, maybe there is a threshold at some point you do pay. Maybe your stance is, yeah, we know we would never pay the ransom unless somehow this specific super critical business uh, system that somehow we can't back up at all was ransomware, right? Um, so maybe, maybe there are some type of, um, you know, situations, or if your situation is, you know, very, very straight of never pay, um, then, um, then you have that, you know, understood your CEOs, your other legal counsel understands. Um, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, um, the, um, as you get into larger environments, um, and more complex environments, that type of, you know, um, item gets a lot more complex. Um, and then what do you get, what actions you take during the event? That's kind of some base questions here. Um, but inside of that, um, let's go back to our uh, business um, email compromise. So we'll go through from ransomware perspective and play some, uh, that was some good, good chat. So we'll get some more people chatting in here. So let me uh, share back out my screen of XMind here. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go in and I'm going to save as I'm going to make this now my my ransomware, you know, fun ransom ransomware playbook. There we go. All right. So now this is going to turn. So we're going to here. Uh, so ransomware playbook. All right. So again, a lot of these things kind of stay the same a little, right? So we still have our awareness. We're still going to have our, you know, tax simulation. You know, maybe we're not doing phishing tests, but you know, maybe we're, um, maybe we have some type of a tax simulation that's, you know, detonating, you know, um, uh, you know, malware and some as it's checking to see that, you know, open file shares and certain things. So maybe, you know, you do have um, uh, something that's testing um, uh, priv escalation, right? Um, right. And then maybe you have, um, you know, something else that's uh, testing, you know, um, uh, file share permissions, right? Maybe you have something else that's, um, you know, that somehow understands um, you know, segmentation, um, you know, system segmentation, right? Um, you know, maybe you have some type of, um, uh, you know, I'll call it uh um, uh, workstation, you know, it's a server environment, right? Um, zones. Um, so again, other base things, again, that you might be able to test and understand. Um, uh, maybe you also have, again, uh, you know, egress, uh, egress network, um, proxy or something like that. So, um, again, some things in there, obviously, you know, you might not be testing all these, but maybe you have a system, you know, like, uh, 
um, uh, that, um, you know, atomic red team or something that is going out, um, and doing some of these tests and some test devices, again, your legal requirement, right. It goes, you kind of go through all these, but now you kind of go into that whole, like, okay, well, are we, um, you know, pay, you know, you know, questions about pain, um, you know, maybe that's something in, in some of these services you have that is, you know, um, uh, you know, the Bitcoin, you know, a wallet, right? Maybe there's, you know, negotiation stuff. Again, you start to kind of connect all those in there. Um, you keep going down through, you again, user, right? This person called in, right? Uh, this This called in. Um, what does the help desk do based on, uh, you know, some type of ransomware? Um, it seems like it might be ransomware. They have some type of thing, uh, some type of, uh, you know, guidelines, right? So what are their guidelines? Um, guidelines on, um, you know, ransomware, right? So uh, maybe they, you know, again, telling the users, uh, you know, do not uh, turn off, right? Um, uh, or, you know, remove, you know, remove network cable. Um, uh, and then, you know, maybe there are some other, you know, guidelines from there, uh, you know, contact SOC, right? Um, and then the SOC kind of goes through and, Again, you kind of can go through and say, okay, well, what's, uh, you know, SOC's going to get called now. Um, what are they going to do? You kind of go through there. Uh, inside of these system alerts, again, you probably don't have a spam report button uh, doing stuff like we did in the business email conference. So you kind of delete that out. Probably don't have email detection um, on, on a, well, we might have an email detection um, if, uh, you know, ransomware is within an email. Um, again, you got your, your SIM, your XDR, right? Uh, your automation and stuff. But what are you going to, again, this specifically was something that's, um, again, uh, outside uh, any type of device inventory. So going back down to, you know, analysis, uh, we're going to go through um, and kind of have, again, you know, device analysis, um, Normally, in a device analysis, we might look to, you know, our, you know, EDR. If we don't have our EDR, we might look to, you know, uh, event logs, right? It might be being forwarded somewhere. It might be on device directly, or we might have to go to collection, right? Manual collection. Um, and what does that look like? You know, if this is an office over in... Um, uh, you know, outside of corporate office, what does that look like? If you're a place that has 40, 40 places and, you know, throughout the nation, do you have remote hands that can just go pick up a machine and ship it? Do you have someone drop ship that? Uh, what does that uh, look like, you know, for, you know, location, right? Um, and things like that. Um, um, Looking at through, yes, I will share these mind maps. Um, that's why I saved the ransomware slightly different. It will save off to a, like an XD file. Uh, it will be specific to, um, uh, sorry, I'm answering some of the chats here uh, for people in the room. Um, the uh, I will share some of them. They might be specific to uh, obviously uh, X mine, but what I'll do is I'll maybe export it as like a, a a picture file or something. Um, uh, so then, oh yeah, if it's even legal to pay the ransom, we're just going through some of the chats here, right? Um, right, yeah, so it might not, again, that's a good point, especially now, is it even, uh, you know, legal, uh, depending on, you know, certain jurisdictions and, and areas. Um, again, always have legal uh, or your cyber insurance decision on engaging FBI uh, via IC3. Uh, I think that's a question. Um, uh, yeah, I would um, always 
definitely, I wouldn't say your cyber insurance, but definitely legal um, on uh, reporting anything to the FBI via IC3, which is their um, uh, internet uh, crimes portal. Um, there are ways to report uh, to IC3, even if um, it wasn't successful. So that's definitely a conversation on your legal uh, with your legal. Other things for that is if you have, if you're a large business um, or potentially government, uh, if you're a government agency, if you have a relationship with your field office, you might be able to share certain things with them uh, directly versus IC3, but that's just something. Um, but yeah, definitely when you talk about LEO contacts, you might have, um, you know, again, uh, different reporting right um, so how that's how that looks um, as an example all right just trying to make sure i'm getting these these chats while i'm going through all right so jumping back down so you know manual collection uh you got a location um if it's a certain location you know do you have um services you know for manual selection? <laughs> Um, do you have mailing services? Again, um, that's something that some, it's easy to kind of set up. Um, uh, so mailing. Um, and again, if it is, you know, remote hands or mailing, um, you're probably not going to understand that. Uh, uh, you're not going to have that for a day or two. So what do you do? You know, do you put that entire, you know, office on, uh, you know, in some type of segmented restricted VLAN just so they can maybe work internally? You know, what does that ultimately, you know, look like? Um, so, at, so then maybe once you get the device, right. Manual collection, um, what do you do with, um, that, that device, right? So, um, you know, now we're kind of going off into, you know, more of the analysis, uh, if, okay, you got manual collection, you know, what are you ultimately going to do, you know, with that? Um, do you have some type of, uh, you know, forensic, uh, forensic capability, or are you just going to, um, uh, you're going to load that into some type of, um, uh, cuckoo box or, you know, other types of manual forensic. Do you have, again, do you have a service? So you get, maybe you're shipping that system directly to a different service, right? Um, you know, do you have some type of, um, uh, capabilities, uh, you know, tooling here, um, there's a lot of forensic tooling um, that can go through um, and understand, you know, kind of what's going on under like search and drive for artifacts. Um, you know, it what what happens if this device is, you know, um, encrypted as well, right? So those are all kinds of things when you go through this. Again, impact size. Well, that's still kind of the same, right? Is this uh, has this spread, right? So you know. Um, so again, if we all of a sudden have, um, you know, from, you know, is this on domain joined machines? Um, is this, you know, uh, now to the, you know, essentially a OT network, right? And you can kind of keep going down, um, uh, you know, multiple offices, uh, and you might, again, it might, again, making these um, mind maps help you kind of then build out your playbooks um, and how they're associated. Um, and again, it's deep analysis needed. Yeah, it's probably still uh, potentially something that you can um, look at doing as well. Containment and eradication, right? So we have, you know, again, if the ransomware ultimately, you know, I guess sometimes pivots and does some emailing, this might be, uh, this might be important and maybe this might not be important. So maybe we remove it out of here. Uh, network segments might be, you know, more specific. Are we, do we already know what that um, specific ransomware is um, beaking out to? Um, is it beaking out to anything? Um, network se segmentation, right? That might be a lot more, um, you know, uh, important for this specific instance. And then do we have, um, you know, uh, isolation, 
you know, VLAN, right? Is that, does that exist? Um, what are then the restrictions on those, right? So maybe, uh, you know, inside of here, it's, you know, no outbound, um, you know, maybe, you know, you know, limited, you know, lateral, um, for whatever reason to get telemetry, I, I don't know, right. Whatever that is, you want to understand how that functions. Um, and then device rights isolation. If this was a domain joined device, we might, uh, want to be specific here, right. Uh, domain joined, um, and then maybe, you know, inside of here we have, um, so you can kind of put one in here and put device, device, non-domain, um, and maybe we still have our EDR on there, uh, one off or not, maybe, you know, and then might want to put one, oops. Another one here and say device, you know, and I'll just call it, you know, um, you know, rogue, right? Um, right, rogue, rogue device. Um, um, so then, um, then going through, you know, that, what would you ultimately do? Did I just do rouge or rogue? That's what I'm like. Yeah, I was right. Um, So, you know, what do we do with this, right? Manual collection, you know, um, and then, you know, we can, you know, understand our forensics, right? So this is going to get into the point of, okay, well, what type of device is it at all, right? Is it some type of IoT? Is it, um, you know, again, Windows, Mac, right? So you might have different capabilities. If you're not a Mac shop, you probably have limited Mac, um, you know, Apple, you know, Mac capabilities. Um, I know a lot of places that were specific in Windows, big Windows environments. It's like, oh, we don't need Mac or Apple stuff. And then all of a sudden they had a thousand iPads and a bunch of iPhones um, and they needed to do forensic on one and didn't have any capabilities. It's like something that could then be... Probably, um, you know, prepared for beforehand going through something like this. Um, and then any identity stuff, again, that's going to be a lot um, uh, very similar as well. Again, might be more capabilities. But again, this is how you can see a um, something like a uh, ransomware playbook going out, just a little more specific um, to, you know, eradication uh, than obviously the email. And then recovery is where it goes into a whole, you know, Again, what what's the impact, right? So, um, uh, and then you might just generally have, oops, you might generally just have, you know, what are your backup capabilities, uh, um, right? Um, so again, impact. Um, again, this is impacting just you know user machines. you know, as impacted some type of, you know, you might have it specifically file shares called out just because of the frequency that that happens a lot or just, you know, server, uh, servers, you know, you know, and then maybe you separately have, you know, databases, right? Um, and this might be all kind of relationships with each other, but maybe you respond differently based on what are these impacted. Um, and then, you know, again, your backups, again, might have a relationship between, you know, all these as well, but what is the, you know, what's your frequency, um, uh, there, uh, for your, you know, backups, um, you know, how are they secured, right? Um, you know, and again, you could keep going on here, um, uh, with, you know, obviously making sure they're tested. Um, and then that goes back up to, you know, potentially simulation, uh, preparedness, rights. Um, but again, um, understanding, you know, those as well.
Um, and then, you know, again, a lot of these, again, probably uh, stay the same. So as you make some of these mind maps, you go through, you might add more that you think about, you know, post incidents, um, you know, uh, versus, you know, uh, other types of uh, situations. Um, so with that kind of going through some of the ransom, ran ransomware playbooks there, um, is there anything else, anyone potentially in the chat, um, you know, kind of going through this, um, uh, this is kind of, uh, coming up to, again, uh, having less than 30 minutes, it's kind of coming up to our last kind of like example, we'll go into kind of a Q and a after this, but anything specific to this ransomware playbook that you see that we can kind of go through that someone would want to call out more. I still see that there are people participating. So I hope there's someone out there. Oh, thanks. Mike B and Woody, Woody still there. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to kind of share off of here, go back to my slides. Um, so again, that was our playbook kind of hands-on. I did that in between instead of um, going all fully in uh, to some of them. But I did want to open it up for essentially some Q&A here, being a workshop. Um, I know we have about 30 minutes left, but I um, want to go through and see if we have any. I know there's a Q&A section here in the, um, in the, in the Zoom, um, as well as just using the chat window that I've been trying to pay attention to. I don't know if there are moderators in the room. Um, uh, again, this is kind of unfortunately last minute virtual. Oh, can I see the questions in the Discord chat? I 100% can go into the Discord chat. Let me do that right now. I am in there. Yep, Xmine is great for, I'm gonna play catch up here. So um, Xmine is pretty great for brainstorming. Um, I have heard of Miro uh, uh, as well. I haven't used it. Yep, a lot of security cheat sheets are moving toward mind maps. Uh, definitely uh, very nice here. Mm -hmm. uh, as said, yeah, the slides will be available afterwards. Let's see. Going back down, I see some conversation in here. Oh, right. So how often should playbooks be checked for revisions? Um, so um, I believe the recording will be available. I, I see that it is recording. Um, I wouldn't see why not, but I think that's something maybe the Wild West staff can, um, um, can answer. The playbooks be checked for revisions. Um, I recommend that playbooks at a minimum be reviewed quarterly, if not monthly. I know that seems very burdensome um, depending on how many playbooks you have. But what I suggest is you have an author and then you have always a reviewer. Um, so again, assuming that if you're building out playbooks and hopefully have a staff larger than two people, but even if you have one person, just scheduling out a whole day of playbook review um, and um, that would be at the minimum. However, if you start to do tabletops, like we did that one with Bill with the financial, uh, you know, uh, BC, and then we did, uh, you know, the security team with the physical security department with their batch machine for ransomware. If you do these small little tabletops like that, and then have your playbooks out and you're constantly reviewing your playbooks with tabletop scenarios, that's kind of a review in itself. Um, so you can do those. Um, I've seen places do them bi-weekly. Um, I've seen some places like I know at Amanda's, um, company, they'll do, um, they will do tabletops via Slack, um, every other day. Um, and then whoever they'll do the scenario will, a Slack bot will post the scenarios out there and then people will respond to it and then they'll just review and it'll be attached to a playbook and they'll just start reviewing the playbooks. And then it will go into, you know, a documentation kind of review. Someone will gather it up and then they'll update their playbooks kind of organically. So it's kind of something where you don't want it to be like a policy 
where you're like, oh, these have to be reviewed annually. We have a policy meeting, a bunch of people vote on stuff. It goes through change, you know, boards and legal, all this stuff. Playbooks are made to be more fluid. You want to have a more organic process. Uh, even if you can empower other team members, maybe even somebody that isn't on the potentially the security team or somebody that uh, just to kind of keep up with the playbooks, get involved a little. Um, so I know we've reviewed, you know, having the help desk supervisor, like uh, help us review the playbooks, you know, or, or a different team and kind of having that rotating around using it as not just something that you have to update all the time, but also something that can, you can create awareness around the uh, environment as well as, you know, build people's knowledge up. Um, I know I can post the slides in, I think there's a workshop research channel um, or no, in the chat, I can post them pretty quickly here after this. Um, so it should be, um, I'll just put them in PDF and just post them to the chat board uh, probably within 20 minutes of after this. Um, so you should have them. Oh, uh, what, what people will do to keep IR playbooks quote unquote offline um, so, um, there is, you know, do, do you just give it preference online storage, like a SharePoint? Uh, there's definitely places that have obviously their SharePoints. They have, um, uh, other types of document, uh, repositories. I'll call them like, uh, uh, if you'd use like share file or some type of other secure quote unquote storage mechanism, that's out of band, just to copy your playbooks up there. Um, I've personally been using GitHub and Git for a lot of playbook documentation uh, more and more often. So it's version control a little better. Um, and I know that a lot of places also started to use Obsidian. Um, uh, Obsidian is like a note-taking tool with uh, some pretty uh, cool features. Um, so I might post, I might put, just post a bunch of resources right after this um, uh, and attempt to organize it so it uh, makes sense. Yeah, the uh, modules and multiple playbooks in OneNote, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, it really helps when you first start out. Um, I really like to be able to link to different OneNotes and stuff. Um, again, if you're not a Microsoft or OneNote shop, or you probably do the same in another note-taking app, but that's really where people start to use the Obsidian where you can tag stuff and you can see relationships. So then you don't have to recreate certain procedures um, if you just need to link to them. Um, so that's a pretty cool uh, thing. Um, if anyone knows of the Obsidian and throw it into a chat while I'm uh, reviewing talking questions here, uh, that'd be helpful. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, again, that's another reason why um, we've been using Git more and more so we can embed Jupyter Notebooks. Obsidian can also embed Jupyter Notebooks so you can have you can have your play, playbooks actually start doing stuff, um, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so I've seen some pretty cool stuff. We have some test stuff that we've been using, but that gets pretty um pretty into the uh, automation Skynet world, uh, which is very cool. I know, again, uh, very familiar with a lot of Microsoft tools. Um, they have a lot of good Jupyter notebooks and things, but, you know, other, you know, um, places, you know, uh, like, you know, some of the Cortex stuff and some of the stuff Palo Alto has and other places, they're starting to really build some of that SOAR and automation into Jupyter notebooks that you can kind of take and, and play with. Yeah, so the, the playbooks in the form of a wiki, that's kind of how Obsidian works. Um, and again, uh, what I'll do is I'll post it, and I keep saying the word, uh, but I'll post it and a few blog articles about it. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, I've seen people use Confluence um, as well um, and linking stuff out. Again, everyone... There's so many tools out there. That's why I say start with something, start with the mind map, start with like the one note and then just figure out whatever tool you want. But if you don't have anything, I've seen places just go from tool to tool to tool and not actually document anything. Um, and it's just, you know, sometimes unfortunate. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and again, yeah, the Subsidian. Um, okay, I'm going to jump from uh, workshop or the discord chat. to now the, um, uh, back to the zoom chat here. Uh, so I see the question from Jason debating with management. Uh, they want exhaustive, very detailed playbooks. Um, when I put on my responder responder, I believe 
they're completely over the top and practical way too long. Right. So no one will end up following them. What's your voice on, on striking balance between length, detail, practice, and effectiveness. I'm currently advocating for one, two page mat short, short and clear. That's why it's important. So you saw that one note. Um, that's why it's important to link to other procedures because a lot of people, uh, when I've seen playbooks, they try to put every procedure in the playbook um, and you really want playbooks to be flexible. So even if it's like um, define you or like, you know, um, uh, you know, review user impact, you know, do you want to have your entire procedure of how you review user impact? No, you just want, you know, generally an analyst to know review user impact link to, you know, definitions on user impact. So you want, that's why you want to link to a bunch of stuff. So I've seen playbooks in basic word format going kind of, you know, and documentation going down to kind of down the drain a little, um, and into more of these tooling and different things, but, uh, definitely want playbooks, not very extremely detailed. I mean, you don't want them to not be detailed either, but you definitely want your playbooks to be, you know, one to three or four pages with a bunch of links. Um, and again, depending on the complexity of the playbook, you might have another playbook for whatever you're, you're requesting in one playbook. So it kind of becomes playbook inception. But if you have an entire crazy legal department that has or regulatory requirements, then you might have an entire playbook depending on whatever incident just on that. So when it says review with legal, you might just refer to a different playbook. So try to, you know, bite size your playbooks um, to start out with. Um, so you definitely want, you don't want exhaustive playbooks, in my opinion, it's not going to help a responder. It might help for auditors. It might help for, you know, executives, but it's not going to help, you know, ultimately now, if it's a major ransomware and you're talking about full compromise and it's in a, like, it's an eviction, like a full domain eviction or something, you might want to have extremely detailed playbook for that for base stuff. You want to try to be on that, that balance. It's something really difficult to kind of work through, especially with management but I would go between the, you know, shorter and effective verse, like a full exhaustive one. Um, other types of incidents besides BC and ransomware that playbooks for, I would suggest reviewing whatever is happening in your environment the most and trying to develop playbooks on those. Another uh, one to start with is probably account takeover. Um, it could happen during, you know, a lot of these event events, but it's something that happens a lot. Um, so I would look at your specific, uh, organization. See if you're getting hit, you're responding with phishing, you're responding with count takeovers a lot. Try to build playbooks off of those first. Uh, incident management system uh, recommendations on an incident management system. Um, if someone looks like they responded, they, they've heard of the Hive incident response tracker, cyber CPR. I've actually reviewed all of those. Um, uh, I would have uh, recommended the Hive. It is good. However, they've gone to a paid model. Um, again, depends on your environments. Uh, I unfortunately work in an environment that we do look towards a lot of open source and, um, I do like that, but a lot of places have different regulatory requirements of there's a lot of good paid solutions out there. Honestly, I, we've some places been just using Git, um, uh, for incident management, um, or some type of, you know, uh, DevOps platform, um, uh, versus, you know, uh, anything else? Um, just again, bare bones. Uh, if you don't have playbooks, you probably don't need an incident management system yet. Um, if you have no playbooks, but uh, there's a lot of good tools out there. Um, I will be posting the resources in the chat, uh, workshop chat in the discord. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Incident com side channels. I think I have that posted um, in the Discord chat as well. So uh, side channels, um, you know, it definitely does depend on your quote unquote um, environment. Um, you know, make sure whatever you do use, you get approved through legal um, and you don't have any type of rogue side channel uh, that you're using, especially during an incident. Um, whatever it is, it's out of band. Um, I know a lot of teams have primarily used whatever base, if they're a G suite or they're a uh, Microsoft shop or they're, you know, another shop, they'll use whatever base um, item is for, for base comms and then side channel comms will be something else. Right. So they'll use, you know, like a Slack that's disconnected, right. There's no single sign on with the environment, but they're using like a separate, you know, um, uh, 
incident channel. And then what they'll do is they'll set up a bunch of guest accounts. Um, cause you could have like an enterprise Slack, um, uh, licensing with, you know, your specific users, and then you could have limited guests. So you could put like a, an announcement or sort of like a, a guest channel for like executives to kind of get incident updates. So I've seen that. Um, I've seen like there be specific tools, like encrypted chat tools that you can use. Um, I would be careful with stuff like signal. I mean, signal is great, but using it for like an approved incident Com side channel, uh, just again, make sure your you have your procedures in place and legal on board because ultimately your incident comms, even the side channels could need to be documented in some form. Um, so they can't be full secret, secret squirrel. So in case you need it for your cyber insurance, you need it for some type of legal needs, some type of, you know, there's liability there in that. So you want to make sure I've seen people use good discord, set up a specific discord channel, uh, you know, specific D discord server. Um, there's some places that have set up their own, you know, specific chat, um, uh, comms as well, especially, you know, companies, again, that need uh, that that level of security there. Uh, so as long as your side channel comms is not connected to your base authentication, your base network, uh, also it's not like constantly up on all your machines. Um, again, you can't have your, you know, your super side com Slack channel just embedded auto, auto logging in on your machine that could be compromised, right? You want to make sure um, that those are fully separate. I've seen teams just have a bunch of Chromebooks um, and, you know, a small separate G suite, like kind of licensing for, you know, side channel comms if they really need them. So they're, you know, kind of easy, um, to get up and running quickly. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, creative and fun ideas with that. Um, so I hope I answered most of those questions. Um, I'll be here for another couple minutes, um, uh, for a few more. Oh, thank you. Uh, and again, I apologize for not having my other, um, you know, uh, other workshop um, instructor here today. So this is my first time doing this solo. So um, I hope the uh, everything um, was informative. I appreciate everybody. I hope that everyone out over in Deadwood is uh, having a great time. Um, and uh um, I'll, I'll wait on for a little more wild for anyone from wild West. Um, I did see a hand raise, but I don't know what that means. Um, because I don't have any questions or anything, but, uh, Oh, that's interesting. Just to kind of, I know people are leaving now, but Nick says their cyber insurance provides an out of band room quote unquote, for instances. That's pretty interesting. I've never heard of that. Um, a cyber insurance providing that. Um, so that's, I mean, it makes sense. They provide services, but, uh, definitely, um, uh, again, another reason to understand your cyber insurance, understand all the services, uh, that they provide. Again, uh, for those, uh, there, I'll put this in the channel too, but again, uh, contact information, for both me, uh, myself, as well as Amanda Berlin. Um, again, I am, uh, uh, Cyborg uh, 00101, I'll be on the chat. I'll kind of say, hey, this is Jeremy. Hopefully no one spoofs me on there, but uh, I'll put a bunch of slides and I'll put all the resources we talked about. All right. Thank you, everybody.